René Descartes, we see that he lived from 1596 to 1650, so a bit of context then. When was Martin Luther? When did he come up with his 95 Theses? That was 1517. So we're talking roughly 100 years later, 100 years after the Reformation. So we've had 100 years of people thinking critically about the church and of all the division that's been occurring as a result. Right? We talked about not only Martin Luther, but all those other reformers. That movement's been going on for 100 years now. And now in this context of France, we have born this man, René Descartes, who received the best possible education a person could receive. He was educated by the Jesuits in that time. Remember who the Jesuits were, the Society of Jesus? Right? They were formed as part of this counter-reformation movement so that we could educate people about the faith. And he had a great education. But math was the only thing that really made sense to him because math was certain and the other things he could just ask too many questions. Descartes was probably like that child who just asked lots of questions. But why? Why? You know, just asking why after why after why, and there comes a point at which you're, you just become exasperated. What he did understand was that 3 plus 2 always equals 5. There are certain things that he could not question. A square always has four sides. There are certain things that he could not question, and those things were in math. Every other class that he had, though, he found himself raising his hand saying, why is that? His conclusion, then, was that his learning, his traditional learning, was not built on a firm, on a solid foundation. So his question was, okay, let's clear, let's take away everything that I've learned, and let's figure out what is this solid foundation that I'm going to build the rest of my life on. I'm going to forget everything else that I've been taught, all this scholastic theology, all these other authorities who've told me things. No, getting rid of all that, what foundation am I going to build my life on? And so he resolved to study and learn from the book of the world. How fascinating. It almost sounds empiricist, learning from the book of the world. I'm going to take a look at the world and see what I see and see what I can learn from that. Sounds more like an empiricist at this point. What, what's going to make the difference here? So he traveled extensively and wrote several works. Initially not publishing some of those works, because what just happened in 1633, wait a minute, he was born in 1596, when he was 37 years old, what happened? Galileo was condemned by the church, by the office of the Inquisition, could have been burned at the stake. Do I really want to publish some of the things that I'm, some of the questions that I'm raising? So initially he suspended his, the publication of his works. His aim was to discover truth through reason. He says, I wish to give myself entirely to the search after truth. If there's one thing I'm going to dedicate my life to, it is the truth. What is the truth? And I will doubt everything in order to arrive at what the truth is. And so he founded his, um, let's come up, let's see what, what, what is the solid foundation that we can come up with something that will be impervious to the corroding effect of skepticism. Simply meaning, some, what are those things that no one in this room will be able to doubt? What can I say, what foundation can we create where no one can question it? No one. His greatest enemy was skepticism. He was a skeptic himself, asked questions. He doubted everything. And what he was going to create was going to be was not going to be susceptible to attack by the, by the skeptics. What can I create that no one will be able to disagree with? I say that a square will always have four sides. I say that A is always A. Okay, let's figure out what are the things that we can say that no one can disagree with. And so Descartes broke with the past, all those authorities of the past, he broke with them. Not trusting any previous philosophy, not even scholasticism. And instead, he was going to rely on his own reason, being a rationalist, over any other authority. I'm not listening to the Pope, or to the Church, or to any theologian, or anyone. I'm going to rely on my own reason. And so, going back to Joe's observation, he was throwing out the baby with the bat. We're throwing everything out. 
Thomas Aquinas, I don't care. We're throwing out everything that I've learned. I'm going to figure out what can I say that no one in this room will be able to doubt. And so he clearly distinguished between what is clear and evident from that which is only probable. So what are those things that we can be certain about and what are those things that are not so certain? Uh, your personal revelations from Mary last night. I don't mean to sound disparaging about the, the personal revelation, <laughs> revelation from Mary, but that's saying, can I be certain that you are receiving a divine message from Mary for all of us? Can I be certain about that? Because if not, then we're going to start with what is, what's clear and what's evident. <coughs> And so he was determined only to use words that had clear meanings. Have you thought about that for church? We as a church use lots of words. Right? The latest word that the Roman Catholic Church introduced in 2011 was consubstantial. When's the last time you talk, when you used the word consubstantial in a sentence? Boy, dinner last night was consubstantial. Right? That ball game, that was quite a consubstantial ball game. When's the last time you used the word consubstantial? We use a lot of words, the meanings of which are not clear. Follow me? I have a nun friend, we, we talked together back in the early 60s. To this day, she will not use that word. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so Descartes was, was simply saying, we're only going to use words that we can all <coughs> understand and agree on. So his chief enemy was not scholasticism. He threw out all the authorities of the past. But his chief enemy then was skepticism. He set himself to systematically doubt all that could possibly be doubted. I'm going to doubt everything. Everything that I say and everything that I, that I think, I'm going to doubt it and come, see what it is that I can come up with that is absolutely certain. He established the Cartesian method, which he described as a set of certain and easy rules such that anyone who observes them exactly, who observes these rules, will never take anything false to be true. So we're going to set up this system so that we never deceive ourselves and believe something that's really not true. That's what this system is all about. And so he's going to use methodic doubt, simply meaning that we must systematically doubt all the ideas we already possess. Everything that you know, begin tonight to doubt it. That's what separated the modern philosophers from those who came before. Descartes said that our mind has two fundamental operations. Our mind intuits and then it deduces. So what are these two operations of induction, excuse me, of intuition and of deduction? <coughs> Intuition is purely intellectual. It goes on in your mind. It's an unclouded and attentive mind that leaves no room for doubt. So intuition, there are certain things that we intuit. And then deduction is everything else. All necessary inference from other facts that are known with certainty. There are some things that we just know with certainty in our mind. And then there are other things that we reason from based on that. <coughs> 